Try to imagine 3,000 atomic bombs similar to those dropped on Japan in World War II hitting the Twin Cities all at once. Well, that is the explosive force the federal government says the Soviets have aimed at the metropolitan area right now. Three missiles, the government believes, each with a five megaton warhead. It would take only 30 minutes for them to get here. And tonight, science editor Tom Hendrick and producer Mike Meyerndorf begin a five-part series titled Nuclear Warning, outlining what that threat means for Minnesotans. Tom? Doug, one bomb probably is aimed above the IDS building right now, the government says. Another about 6,000 feet over the state capitol, still another at the international airport. Where would you be if it happened one evening? Say, this evening. Now, at this moment. <laughs> The Oz nightclub, just blocks from the state capitol. Party goers are having a good time. It doesn't concern me. If it hits, it hits. If it doesn't, it doesn't. The first thing that one would see is a flash of light. There's been no sound, just the flash of light. Solid material is instantly heated and becomes gaseous. If you're watching someone next to you, suddenly they char. Buildings spontaneously are charred and ignited. Joggers a mile and a half away from the Metrodome at Lake Harriet are caught in mid-stride. The lake begins to boil. Dr. Jack Geiger explains what happens next. Almost simultaneously, winds of 500 to 700 miles an hour, knocking what's left of the buildings down and picking up that rubble and starting to hurl it over all of the rest of the city. Four miles out in what's usually called the third zone of destruction, uh, with a 50 square mile area, four miles in any direction, we would see that same light flash. We would have that same heat. We'd see people uh, broiling, charred, uh, as if they were steaks on a grill. Out at eight miles, we would see significant damage to more lightly constructed buildings, ordinary homes, the kinds of ranch homes or two-story homes that people live in. The environment would still, at that distance, be catching on fire. As far west as the Minnesota Zoo in Apple Valley, feathers, hair, and skin may spontaneously combust. As far east as Stillwater, there is 1,400-degree heat as winds create fireballs several miles across. The St. Croix, too, begins to steam. It gets hotter and hotter and burns very rapidly, and uh, those firestorms and the initial fireball, even from the nuclear weapon, can burn people who are 30 or more miles away from the, the nuclear explosion itself, and, and the firestorm often burns what, what is not destroyed by the initial uh, explosion itself. 1,400,000 of the metropolitan areas 1,600,000 inhabitants are killed. 60 miles away, in Cambridge, the evening sky is 30 times greater than the midday sun. In Cambridge and throughout the rest of Minnesota, fallout could be as deadly as missiles themselves. Fallout spreading up to 600 miles south and east from the Twin Cities. And Duluth, also considered a probable target in a total war, because of the population and industrial base. But military installations west of us, more certain to be hit, create the deadliest fallout potential. This is a Minuteman II silo in the middle of the South Dakota prairie. It holds a 10 megaton warhead, which is equivalent to more than 600 Hiroshima bombs. There are 150 missile sites like it in this state alone and about as many in North Dakota, all of them upwind from Minnesota, and every one of them a prime Soviet target even in a so-called limited nuclear war. Somewhere on the order of two to 3,000 warheads would probably be going off uh, in Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota uh, in such an attack. So That's a lot of nuclear warheads. We could expect very high levels of radiation to be dropped on this area uh, within a matter of hours or days after such an attack. Now, even with a shielding factor of 90 percent Assuming you stay for that period of time underground and don't go outside, you've still received what's called an LD-50. 50% of the people exposed 
to one-tenth of that 4,000 rads, that is 400 rads, 50% of those people would die even with the very best medical attention. You can see how the medical resources would be totally overwhelmed and totally incapable. Those who have been exposed to radiation will have some diarrhea and will lose fluid. There may be some vomiting, a good deal of vomiting as well. I was screaming all the time, kill me, please leave me alone. Now I live 37 years after the bomb. I just wished never happened to the other people, especially young children and babies. We had a, enough victims. That's the story of what would happen. If it does, you probably won't see the whole story. Tomorrow night, we look at civil defense plans to evacuate target areas to small towns if an attack appears to be imminent. As 100 million lives. Evacuation centers it would be an orderly, controlled evacuation. Your own local authorities will give detailed instructions through radio, television, and the press, telling you what necessities to take along. These plans are being drawn right now for Minnesota. And tomorrow night, we'll look at whether evacuation could be accomplished in time, whether it could be accomplished effectively or at all. Good evening, everyone. The Soviet Union has, at long last, ended its silence on the issue of nuclear arms reduction. Well, Soviet President Brezhnev announced today his nation is willing to begin arms talks with the United States immediately. He also proposed a freeze on the nuclear arms buildup, but flatly rejected President Reagan's plan for a bilateral arms reduction. Brezhnev did, however, try to calm fears in Western Europe by promising that no further SS-20 missiles will be deployed in either the eastern or western regions of Russia. These missiles already deployed are now aimed at Western Europe. President Reagan received the news with cautious optimism, saying that he is encouraged by the Soviet willingness to open a dialogue over the issue of nuclear arms. And he indicated that talks could begin by the end of June. But he scoffed at Brezhnev's plan for an arms freeze, saying the Soviets simply want to ensure permanent military superiority. Meanwhile, the local outcry for peace is getting louder. The latest group to go on the record is the Minneapolis City Council. Today, a council committee voted three to one in favor of a resolution calling for a reduction in nuclear arms stockpiling. It also asked for a ban on all underground nuclear testing. All 13 aldermen will get a chance to vote on the measure at the council meeting a week from Friday. And last night, in part one of our series, Nuclear Warning, we showed you what the federal government believes would happen here in Minnesota if there was an all-out nuclear war. And it would all happen in just a matter of minutes. But the federal and state governments are working on plans now to save the metropolitan population. Evacuation plans, and they're based on the premise that some crisis should, could, would precipitate a war. And there might be time to get out of town, but where would one go? And what would one do when, when one got there? These are among the questions science editor Tom Hendrick and producer Mike Myrendorf have tried to answer in part two of Nuclear Warning. Tom? Dave, can you imagine an orderly evacuation with the threat of nuclear war hanging over your heads? Would there be traffic jams? Would police stay behind to direct traffic? Where would you go? That's the four billion dollar question. He did what we all must learn to do. You and you and you and you. This was the way to survive in the 1950s and early 60s. Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. a boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Now, with thousands of shelters to provide cover, ducking isn't considered enough. Children leave this school shelter in a tornado drill. 
The government concedes most shelters would become crematoria in a direct attack, and that many aren't much good against fallout. This is the shelter which is headquarters for Minnesota Civil Defense, now called Emergency Preparedness. The communication system here, protected by special aluminum insulation and designed to work after normal systems have been destroyed, doesn't work in a thunderstorm. And this is the shelter underneath Minneapolis City Hall. We affectionately call this the uh, catacombs. It is perhaps the safest shelter in the area from fallout, but not a blast. And we've got uh, space in City Hall for 47,000 people. You should bring your own personal effects and your own cots and blankets, uh, some food if you can, whatever you can bring for your own uh, comfort and safety and your well-being would be necessary to bring because we don't have very much in the building for, uh, for support. The reason there isn't much support is a new government emphasis that evacuation of target areas is the best chance for survival. As this new government film indicates, there may be ample warning that attack is imminent. The simplest way to save them is to move them out to small towns and rural areas where the only likely danger is fallout. So the federal government, in cooperation with state and local governments, is now working on detailed plans for temporary relocation of these high-risk areas. In other words, if we don't evacuate out of the big cities, well, then you might be prepared to evaporate, in other words. Don Hodges, in charge of Minnesota evacuation plans, says it would take about three days for an orderly abandonment of the Twin Cities. We're having them go out in what the areas here, in the yellow areas, we're going out clear as far as Hubbard. We're going clear out here, Travers, Grant, Douglas, and clear south down to Nobles and Pipestone area. These counties are all designated as hosting areas. The evacuation area is in the range of heavy fallout from missile sites almost certain to be hit in the Dakotas. But if the Twin Cities are struck, fallout east would be heavy too. Cambridge, 60 miles north, population 3,170, is where 40,000 Twin Cityans would go for shelter, settling throughout Isanti County. There's, there's no way this community can take care of 40,000 people for one night, let alone any extended period of time. You know, our water supply is in here, our sewer supply is in here. Uh, the community just is not set up to do it. Like other host areas, there is no more money in the plan for such things as food or medical supplies, even though the federal government has asked hospitals to prepare for additional patients. There are no extra police either. He would have to let them have what they needed, no matter if, you know, no matter what sacrifice it took on our part. You know, it's. People have got to have food. Uh, on top of it all, you or I as an individual wouldn't be able to uh, keep them from getting it, physically. 32. This is one of the biggest fallout shelters in Cambridge, now used for fun. Of the $4 billion earmarked nationwide for crisis relocation, most of it is for training and for surveying of shelters to determine how well they shield against radiation. Most Isanti County shelter spaces are not considered adequate, and there are not enough. Only 28,000. That means 12,000 Twin Cities evacuees would have to fend for themselves. You are not going to find enough fallout shelters adequate to protect you from radioactive fallout, no matter where you go out in the country. Right now, we have a, a strictly a civil defense paper organization, not too much other things to back, back it up. 19 Minnesota counties have passed similar relocation plans. Others are expected to this summer. I'm a loyal person to our government's plan. If something would happen that, uh, that we're trying to save as many people as possible, I just think if we ever get to the point of nuclear explosions that it's just all over, you know. The government is also planning to issue emergency change of address cards, and it has already printed a coloring book to keep children occupied coloring pictures of things to take to fallout shelters. Thank you, Tom.
The Soviet Union is seeking a freeze in the production, the testing, and the deployment of nuclear weapons. And President Reagan says that both sides should reduce their atomic arsenals, but after we have upgraded our own nuclear strength. Summit talks are expected to begin soon. In the meantime, there are questions on whether the U.S. is upsetting or merely reaching a balance of power. Why so much money has been earmarked for weapons when the government admits there are already more than enough to destroy the world? These are among the issues that producer Mike Myrendorf and science editor Tom Hendrick address in part three of our series, Nuclear Warning. Tom? Overkill. We have it. The Russians have it. But overkill may not be the issue as much as new technology, which, depending on your perspective, will either deter or start World War III. Inside this mountain in the Colorado Rockies, a third of a mile within one of the hardest granite formations on Earth, is the North American Aerospace Defense Command. This is the early warning radar system command post. Months ago, there was a mechanical failure. It would appear that we had uh, a possible missile attack on the North American continent, starting with two missiles, going up to 22 missiles, 222 missiles. The malfunction was traced and corrected within minutes, but not before the entire retaliatory arsenal was alerted, 9,480 warheads strong. It has happened more than once. Okay, I'm putting in Oscar 6, Papa 7, Oscar 6, Papa 7, Oscar 6, Papa 7. Okay, I concur. That's a good call. This missile crew in South Dakota received the code of attack and started the procedures it has practiced for many times. Coming up on key turn, 10 seconds. Okay, I'm with you. Hands on your keys. There. Three, two, one, mark. I got the lights. The structure of, of the message that started coming out was obviously not an exercise. Then it, it dawned on me a couple of seconds later, you know, my God, this is, this is uh, the real thing. Six, seven, nine, and 11 away. The attack procedure was stopped. There are many safeguards. It was very sobering. We were ready to, we, you know, we were ready to take those actions. I had no hesitation. But I had quite a feeling of despair that this might, you know, deterrence might have failed. In 1981, there were over 500 major missile events somewhere in the world. And uh, we know through uh, a variety of resources, intelligence, post-launch information, that we detected every one. Initial detection will be made by a satellite system we have out in space. Peaceful launches, satellites, or spacecraft are easily discernible from attack missiles, officials say. It would take only 30 minutes for Russian missiles to get here, less time for coastal targets. The detection and quick retaliatory ability are two major factors of deterrent strategy. Another is survivability. Two nuclear submarines carry enough warheads to destroy every major Soviet city. The Navy has 41 nuclear subs. The hundreds of land-based missiles could be launched within five minutes of warning. The Russians have no anti-ballistic missile system of any consequence. As the president says, once launched and that's it. B-52s like these at Ellsworth Air Base near Rapid City may be the least survivable, not because they can't respond as quickly, but because they can be shot down. This is a major reason, officials say, for needing new weapons. In most cases, what we are doing is retiring older systems and bringing in newer systems. For example, uh, a large number of the new warheads that we're producing are for the air-launched cruise missile, which is designed to make sure that bomber weapons can penetrate the extensive Soviet air defenses. We have more because we have uh, less confidence that uh, the bombers can penetrate those air defenses. But the cruise and land-based MX missile systems, critics say, not only add to the arsenal, but add to the threat of war. Their word is destabilization. It will give the Russians less time to determine real attack from computer failure or fear a U.S. first strike could prevent their retaliation. The University of Minnesota's Ed Anderson is a former advisor at the Pentagon. You have to be driven to the conclusion that if you're in a tense situation, you have to fire first. I think it's in inescapable. And I think this is something that, that people need to understand, that this kind of a standoff situation uh, uh, leads to a very high pros probability of, of worldwide suicide. Meantime, while numbers, accuracy, and quickness increase on both sides, the U.S. government's declared policy is we may use nuclear weapons first if the Soviets attack with conventional forces. The U.S. conventional force is much smaller and is equipped with tactical nuclear weapons about Hiroshima size. Soviet Union is not afraid of a first strike 
surprise bolt out of the blue attack against their homeland. What we're t in the no first use doctrine what we're talking about uh, involves whether or not after we have been attacked by conventional weapons, uh, whether our, and our allies have been attacked, whether or not we would respond at some point with nuclear weapons. And what we're saying is we might, we might not. I've had nightmares about it. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very hard thing. Nobody can, can very easily contemplate the thought of nuclear war. It's like a Pandora's box. We've got to learn how to, to get control of the situation. And I think one of the most valuable things that we in the, the, the strategic deterrent forces are doing is, is that we're buying time. We're buying time through our deterrence for the politicians and the diplomats and, and the people uh, who are taking this debate up in public forum to find a solution. Thousands are taking to the public debate, believing now more than ever it is a question of life and death. Tomorrow night, we'll take you inside this grassroots movement. Dave. Thank you, Tom. The atom bomb has been around for 37 years, but in the last year, the movement to ban the bomb has mushroomed, to coin a phrase, all around the world. Tonight, in part four of our series, Nuclear Warning, science editor Tom Hendrick and producer Mike Myrendorf look at why all this has happened, Tom. Dave, since the series began, viewers have been asking what they can do to prevent nuclear war. Tonight is for them. This is what grassroots means. There's an awful lot of dollars that's being spent needlessly on, on destruction. And what's the sense, I mean, you destroy and you got to rebuild again. And in this case, now, if you destroy, you wouldn't have a chance to rebuild. Please stay off the grass and try not to leave any mess after you go by. One, two, three, four, we don't want a nuclear war. Everywhere, it seems, war is on the agenda. Smile and the world smiles with you. Sing a song. This is the Beltrami County Rotary Club. We must have peace. And in the long run, nothing is stronger than the actual feelings and demands of the people. We ought to know this. This is what gave us our revolution. Yeah, there's been a real good response in this neighborhood. And yeah, I see a lot of homes. We've been, yeah, the goal is to talk to every household in that whole community. 130,000 Minnesotans and millions nationwide have signed up in the growing army waging peace. It is an enlistment for life. The first battle is to stop additional nuclear weapons production and deployment. We could launch 9,000 warheads against the Soviet Union. They could launch 7,000 against us. How many is enough? Any nation that turns its eyes from this reality is a nation that is psychologically unwell. Mark Hatfield, Republican senator from Oregon, has 25 senators so far committed to his freeze bill in the Congress. Minnesota senators are not among them. Because the, the reason it's slow coming to me is that Ground Zero National hasn't gotten their next shipment in. This is Michael Andreg, a geneticist, now up to his chromosomes in the politics of war and peace. So get about six of these done. And the only place we can get it is um, the library, because Kiko's is closed. Andreg, never an activist before, is active now heading Minnesota's Ground Zero, the state version of the national volunteer organization to make the public more aware of the horrors of the atom. As a geneticist, he knows. Everyone has a personal reason. So I think my family's in danger. I think the country's in danger. And I think that we need to cultivate a wiser electorate and a wiser political leadership in order to deal with these problems. Like I come from Britain, and when I was over there in the summer, people in Europe are really running scared. There's no doubt about it. And they know about war. They're still, I mean, they're still living it in a way. They're, they're, there are still holes in Europe from the last one. Fueled by government talk of limited nuclear war and first use of nuclear weapons, some people are quietly opening up their company Xerox machines and Watts lines, as well as donating their time. A woman confined to a bed, she has an iron lung, polio, uh, deeply concerned. The military, 
uh, people within the industries, within Honeywell and Spur Univac, coming out saying they want to do something about this. The church is starting to really wake up and get involved. Uh, do you find that all these people have something in common? Yeah, the, the biggest thing they have in common is that they're, they really are not sure that they are even going to have a decent old age, much less their children. It's an astonishing phenomenon. I find uh, all kinds of people interested and supportive of the notion that there's a kind of insanity that is gripping our two nations as we plunge toward higher levels of arsenal, uh, nuclear arsenals. And well, they're making bombs with my tax money for a war where nobody wins. The Minneapolis City Council is expected to act on a freeze resolution next week. St. Paul already has. So has the Minnesota legislature. Both Minnesota senators favor some kind of freeze proposal, too. Meantime, people in other regions are more active in their opposition. This is Cambridge, Massachusetts. Unless and until I'm convinced uh, that our country is doing its level best to achieve nuclear disarmament, uh, I'm not going to participate in helping our government to arm further with nuclear weapons. Here, the city printed information about what would happen if the bomb dropped and sent thousands of copies to other cities as well as to its own citizens. And it rejected the federal government plans to evacuate metropolitan areas during a nuclear crisis as so much nonsense. So I think that a full-scale revolt of the cities against civil defense uh, would be probably the most effective single step that uh, American citizens can take to force the federal government to meaningful negotiations uh, for nuclear disarmament. Wiley, a Cambridge city councilman, says dozens of other cities have taken similar actions. And the idea seems to be gaining some popularity here in Minnesota. Dave. Good work, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. The nuclear arms race is the topic for a WCCO television town meeting immediately following the 10 p.m. report about 17 minutes from now. Uh, Pat Miles and Mike Walsher will head up the program featuring a panel of experts on nuclear strategy and a studio audience this time to discuss this very complicated issue. We also invite you at home to call in with your questions. If you live in the metropolitan area, you may call 330-2404. If you live out state, you may call us collect at area code 612-330-2688. And then please stay tuned for the town meeting at 10.30 here on Channel 4. Government spending for nuclear weapons is increasing. At the same time, the money for social programs has been cut. And that has led to cries to stop the escalation from rather some unusual quarters, from numerous former government officials to members of the defense establishment. Tonight in part five of our series, Nuclear Warning, WCCO Science Editor Tom Hendrick looks at this phenomenon. Tom? Dave, there are many personal stories because people on the inside fear nuclear war too, of course, and some are risking their jobs and reputations to try and stop it. And so it's mostly the kind of bomb that we design, which is known as implosion weapon. That's gone into the fantastic stockpile that now counts more than 50,000. Nuclear war is a destruction of humanity. George Kistiakowski is one of the scientists responsible for the atomic age. One of the Oak Ridge boys, who 37 years ago engineered the first A-bomb here in secret, and in fear the Germans might develop it first. The concept of nuclear deterrence was born here too, and Kistiakowski was an avid believer. Much of his life since has been in government. He was national science advisor to Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. Now, at 82 and dying of cancer, he is living to warn the public that weapons production has gone too far, is out of control, unnecessary, and dangerous. MX is a particularly absurd thing. There's a first strike weapon, and that means it invites an preemptive first strike by the other side, when there's an especially acute political crisis. Kistiakowski claims the defense industry conspired years ago to create the economic and political power it now has. I know how, how Pentagon operates. I know how many lies, systematic lies, are developed there to raise the military budgets, to provide career opportunities, 
because over the years and very deliberately and consciously, the Pentagon developed a system of contractors, the members of the, this military industrial complex, in every congressional district that threatened punishment to a congressman unless he votes for bigger military budgets and so forth. This is Vicki McKenzie, also working for peace and war. She is employed by FMC Corporation in Fridley, the largest defense contractor in Minnesota. There are more than 400 defense contractors in the state paid between $10,000 and $300,000 a year. McKenzie says she couldn't find a job as a machinist in another industry. No one else was hiring. No one else is growing like this. One shop trip we went on was in Hopkins, and we visited a plastic injection molding shop where they made plastic parts for carburetors for, and for toys, and they also made little plastic bullets that are used in the anti-personnel bombs. You can't really tell it, that it's a part for a, a launcher or a gun. It, it could just as well be a, a ring for a tractor motor. Doug McKenzie also works in the defense industry, reluctantly, while attending law school. He also can't find other work. One out of every five bridges needs major rehabilitation or, or replacing. One out of every four miles of the interstate needs to be rebuilt. The, uh, in the Minnesota, 35% of the wastewater treatment plants are at full capacity or above. And people can understand that our economy is in a bad way right now and that the military, the growing military budget probably does have an effect on that. My eight-year-old asked us why we work in a defense plant at the same time that we're opposed to a military buildup and it is, is very difficult to answer her, I think. The blast wave would hit about five seconds after that went off and it would be 440 miles an hour. That would pick those kids up and throw them at the rate of almost 80 feet per second in this direction. They would probably come right in these windows, your children, with a shattered glass and fall in your laps on fire and alive. And this is Louis Lavoie, a nuclear physicist who works for Honeywell Defense Systems. I started checking the figures and every calculation that I did gave results that were far worse than anything I had ever read, even by the anti-nuclear people. Now, Lavoy is one of the anti-nuclear people. He spends almost every weekend speaking out against the dangers of war. And an unstable nuclear world is a world that looks like it's on its way to death. The people, the land, the air, the children, the future. Hi, Lou. At Honeywell, Lavoy helps engineer conventional weapons. Some are necessary, he says. Some are not. He agrees that the Russians have got to be watched, but not the Russians alone. The citizens of this country are beginning to feel that it's time for us to use our limited resources for life and not death. If a person has any moral sense at all, I can't speak about other people. If I have any moral sense at all, I have to speak out. I can't let this go by without saying something. Thousands are saying something. A UN disarmament conference is planned for next month in New York City. The president says he and Soviet leader Brezhnev may meet at that time. Thank you, Tom.